Hello, Dreamcatchers, and welcome to another exciting day in the Writer's Haven. I am your host, V. Helena, and today we are continuing our coverage of the Annapolis Film Festival, and I am speaking with producer, writer, all-in-all all filmmaker, Melissa Hazlip, who uh, premiered her film. Was it first premiered here, or it's it's been around the circuit for a minute? It's actually been around the circuit for almost a year now. Okay. We had our world premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival 2018, okay. so that was in April. So we're just concluding a year's worth of film festivals next month. Awesome, awesome. Now I want to tell you a, a bit about Melissa because she's awesome. Uh, she's an award-winning filmmaker. Um, she's a graduate graduate of Yale University. Did you study film there? No, I studied art history and literature actually. Okay. Okay. Um, and she was a Chaz and Roger Ebert producing fellow and the 2016 artist in residence at the National Black Programming Consortium. You didn't know I was going to say all this stuff about you. I'm not finished. In 2013, she produced the film You're Dead to Me, which is a film that dealt with the topic of transgender and among teens. And the film went on to win numerous awards, including Best Short at the 2014 Imagine awards and real sisters of the diaspora in 2009 she founded her production company shoes in the bed an independent film production company producing cinematic works of nonfiction with an emphasis on diverse new voices and filmmakers of color and the company's first feature length film documentary mr soul was conceived and screened as a work in progress at ifp spotlight spotlight on documentaries during the Independent Film Week and at Martha's Vineyard African American Film Festival where it won the Audience Award. So having garnered funding from an amazing, amazing cadre of sources for this film, it she completed it and it aired, like I said, again, um, here in Annapolis. And so she's here to talk about this accomplishment and many others. So thank you again for coming to the set and um, talking to us about your work. Let's start with Soul. And what was the impetus for you wanting to produce it? And why was it important? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's great to be here in Annapolis. So Mr. Soul is a feature-length documentary about the first Black Tonight Show, which was called Soul, actually. Many people have heard about it, but many people haven't. So I like to say it's the greatest show you've never heard of. Uh, but for those who do know Soul, it's a very, very important um, television show in the annals of broadcast history because it was the first variety show that was produced, directed, and hosted by an African-American man at a time when there was no such thing as diversity in television. And that was 1968, 1968. is when it... Yeah, 1968, a very volatile year and uh, in the country in terms of being on the heels of civil rights. Martin Luther King had just been assassinated five months prior. And the landscape of television was really completely white and didn't rep represent or reflect the culture. So to have this show burst onto the scene and bring artists, poets, musicians, uh, people of the community, doctors, lawyers, uh, dancers, and jazz musicians and express all the different like layers of black life in an honest way that was revolutionary yeah. it was just you know we have so many options today we live in a scroll up culture people consume 3,000 images before breakfast it's a different kind of world but if you take yourself back to 68 when color television had just started the idea of seeing black people and seeing them beautifully was was completely new so it's really refreshing to see this show now, it's called Soul, and we wanted to do a documentary about it because it was the 50th anniversary of the show from 1968 to 2018. And to really take a look at the birth of diversity and inclusion on television, and to also examine how far we have come and how far we have yet to go in terms of representation and inclusion. So there, there's him the man but he's also my uncle and, and so there was a way that you probably approached telling the story T talk to us a little bit about that yes absolutely it's hard when you have a subject that you're related to because you're 
automatically biased. And the assumption is that you will treat it as a valentine, that you will make it an ode to or some sort of tribute to. And I was very conscientious of that because I wanted his story to really be revealed because he was such a unique person, Ellis Hayslip. And I didn't want it to make it about me. So I had to put my feelings aside, but at the same time, my relationship with him really informed how we treated him as a character because I wanted him to be the hero in his own story. Even though he'd lived a difficult life, and he was actually um, a gay uh, African-American man at a time when that really wasn't um, accepted in 1968 and wasn't expected in terms of a presence on television, what that meant. Um, and so we wanted to portray him as a hero as opposed to a victim and to explore him but not exploit him. So that those, I think coming out of love, and that's my relationship, that guided me the whole time, that I was always going to be fair, honest, uh, accurate, but also loving in the portrayal of him. And to show the battles he waged just to push forward this idea of equality on television when we were already battling that reality, you know, fighting for equality as African Americans, yeah. to understand that that was a battle that he waged every day and every year, but he was still able to create such a beautiful show mm -hmm. that showcased, you know, many of the African American icons of the 20th century, and sometimes, in some instances, gave them their first start. So to be able to see, you know, Al Green for the first time, Earth, Wind, and Fire for the first time, Patti LaBelle for the first time, Ashford and Simpson, uh, these were icons in the community, but they weren't, they hadn't been given their place on television. And so he had this idea that black excellence needed to be seen and needed to be validated. And that was really the impetus to tell the story the way that we did and to hope that people would understand that having the Hayes up name wouldn't be a hindrance <laughs> to making the film but that it would actually be an, a greater insight into making the film. But I had to prove myself because that was the first thing that people expected. You know, oh, she's just going to do a little tribute. <laughs> but I had to remind them that this wasn't my story, and I'm not in it. I'm just the vehicle to tell Ellis Hazlip's story. So certainly his story started before 1968, and certainly he had done a lot since 1973 when the story, when the uh, show closed. Why did you choose to do it in the way that you did it and just cover the years that the show was around? You know, the reason we decided to just cover those five years is because it's such What's normally expected is a cradle-to-grave kind of documentary. You know, someone was born, here's what happened, and then they died. But we realized that the birth of the show and the impact that the man, Ellis Hazlip, had on the show were happening in tandem. And so we decided to just zero in on these five years. They were also the most impactful years in terms of changes of the landscape of television from 68 to 73, you went from no people of color <laughs> to sort of, you know, Sanford and Son and the Jeffersons. And, you know, it was a quite a quick transition. But what was lost was that sense of, of movement and, and uh, you know, the, the black power movement. Things were the black arts movements. All of it was kind of compressed in this five year. Yeah, and he televised and the revolution there. The revolution was televised. <laughs> it was. So we decided that because there is so much to cover, if we could just focus in on these five years, it would give a window into not only the show, but also the man. And then the third storyline is what was happening in America, the zeitgeist, and how that impacted the story. Because it was so much material. It almost felt like it should have been a series. You know, the black arts movement deserves its own series, I think. And we could have probably made it into a four-part series, but we only had the funding to make a feature documentary. It was ambitious. Um, you said that you determined that you wanted to just focus on those five years, and you were very intentional about doing it in that way. What were some of the challenges, though, even after you made that decision and even after you, know, you had a blueprint of how you wanted to attack it? What were some of the challenges that you faced? The first challenge and the most 
important challenge to overcome was had always been and will always be and continues to be uh, funding. Um, we decided that because the show, the show itself, the Soul Show, was funded by grants for public television, and we thought, well, that should be the same vibe for the film that we're creating. We wanted it to have the same pedigree, if you will. We didn't want to have some rich person in the back, you know, in our back pockets paying for it because we wanted it to be by the people for the people, which was Ella, always Ellis Hazlip's intention. And probably given a chance, I wouldn't do it that way again. <laughs> It was a noble effort, but it's hard to make a film without money. And when you are applying for grants, what happens is you have to follow the granting season and the granting um, com competition. It's, it's a small field with a vast amount of competitors. Everyone's looking for money from the same pool. And you have to constantly write grants and if you can spend a year writing a grant and then learn that you didn't get it, and then a whole year has gone by without funding. So the timing of production and needs for funding can be very challenging. Is that why it took 10 years? That's partly why, and mostly why, yeah. Because we had to, we won a very large grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, which is really unheard of, especially for an African-American first-time filmmaker who is not, making a film that's not uh, based on a like a Pulitzer Prize winning you know historical novel that kind of thing and also didn't have a, a broadcast lineup already because grants that come from large federal organizations are usually counting on the fact that it's a film for PBS for a strand that's already in progress like great performances or American Masters or POV or one of those strands that we know so to be a completely independent filmmaker without any strings attached to anything and to create something and then demand the, you know, the stamp of approval from a large federal agency was very hard. Uh, and we got development grants from the NEH and the NEA, which was wonderful, and created relationships with them. And so when we went back to them for production funding, they granted it. And uh, it was over half a million dollars. And that was really remarkable. Given all that you have just said about how you entered into that scene um, with the project that you were working on and not having some of the advantages of having um, a, a vehicle to distribute or to broadcast, um, but still um, staying true to this is what I want to do, this is what I want to get out there, and getting it done is just so, so inspiring. What, what what caught the eye of the grantors was that they realized how important the television show was, that it was a cultural touchstone. So they luckily didn't look at me as, you know, Melissa Hazel, who's that? You know, she's not Ken Burns, you know, it's, like, it's not an automatic yes. But they looked at the importance of the show and the fact that we were trying to situate it in the canon of, you know, historical uh, television shows that have impacted culture and they saw the value of that and that I, I always knew that but trying to write a grant that would convey that in an intellectual way with uh, academic scholars attached and historians there's a way that you have to present the material so that it validates or justifies money from the federal government the national endowments and to, to properly situate, I think that was the greatest accomplishment, not even making the film, but to have it validated and justified in the greater annals of our, our cultural history. I always knew that, but I didn't know if I had what it took to be able to convey that. And that is how learning how to write a grant was just as much part of the process. Because, you know, I've been talking about the show for years, and people are like, yeah, 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 that sounds great. But... You, how do you convey, no, but it's really important. Yeah. And it's not my story. You know, don't look at this, actually, but look at the story of America that we're trying to show. And can you justify that? And can you help us situate this historically? So that's, that's what kept me motivated for the 10 years. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. And we're glad that you stayed motivated. Yeah. Um, let's talk about your other work, okay. the issue of transgender um, and teens in general. 
Um, tell us how did you come to produce a film that uh, was on that subject matter? This was really interesting. It's a film called You're Dead to Me. It's a short film that is really close to my heart. Um, I was in a project uh, called Project Involve, which is a diversity initiative um, funded by Film Independent, which is a filmmaker's um, group in, out of Los Angeles. They're responsible for the LA Film Festival and the Independent Spirit Awards, which are the fun awards that happen the night before the Oscars, ah. where everybody's a little loose and they're at the <laughs> beach and, you know, it's all the same films, but people are really relaxed because it's the independent spirit. So Film Independent uh, is a really important organization that uh, really champions the work of independent filmmakers. And they had a special division to take diverse filmmakers who are emerging and give them um, like a fellowship throughout the year and we were able to make films during that fellowship. So I had the chance to do that and I paired up with um, a wonderful team of writers and directors and we created this story that I thought was really unique because it was about a, a Latina mother who was coming to terms with the loss of her child and we treated it as a love story, as a tragic story, and she was celebrating Dia de los Muertos, which is the Day of the Dead, in a way that the Latino culture honors their dead. But also very symbolic, because there was the mother and child relationship. What we didn't reveal was that the child was transgender, transgender and that she, the mother, was even in death, in denial of that and wanted to have her the spirit of her daughter, but it was the spirit of the son who came back to visit her. So that was total giveaway. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> but what was really, really special about this film was that there was so much universality in it because everybody understands the feeling of rejection, the feeling of mother and child. The, the, just these emotional issues about loss and love. And I saw that theme, and even though it was a Latino theme, I said, you know, we can all feel this. And it was, you know, it was about five years ago, before, six years ago now, before this topic of transgender um, issues became, came to the forefront. And I realized, if we can tell a beautiful human story, maybe we can open up eyes for people who are interested and drawn in by the universal themes before they realize that, oh, this is something more unusual than they might you know, be used to. Um, but I wanted people to have the feeling of love and loss across all boundaries. In this case, it was a mother mourning her child, but also mourning the fact that the child had, um, you know, was two-spirited in a way. It's a beautiful film, and I'm telling you that many people see it different ways. Some people see it as a ghost story. Some people see it as a, a, a loss. And, um, but people who have experienced loss in many ways have really been touched by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it won a lot of awards, and un in an unusual way, it played over 50 festivals across the United States, and it went to Europe, and it went to the British Museum, and there's something very special about it. We were inspired by films like, um, do you remember that film, The Sixth Sense, yes. when you didn't know until yeah, the end until the that it was a ghost, ghost. story? Yeah, yeah. We kind of used that as a feeling because we didn't want to have the audience feel biased without understanding what the story was. We wanted them to see the mother and the child and not realize that it was a ghost. Right. And also not realize until the very end yeah. that the daughter had become the son and that the mother was still struggling with that. So yeah, it was really very special. And um, I tend to gravitate towards projects that have a soul and that really speak to you like that and try to convey something more than what you're expecting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's, I think, the true gift and artistry of filmmaking is um, you know, your, there's your vision uh, of, and your intent yeah. of what you're putting out there. But the beauty of it is the perspective of the viewer can be very different mm -hmm. given their own experiences. It's true. And that's an awesome feeling. Isn't it? It's true, and sometimes filmmaking is, when you see it, you know already what's gonna happen, and you're not surprised, and you're not challenged, and you're like, oh, I saw that coming a mile away, yeah. you know? 
I think sometimes filmmakers are unwilling to take risks and people were really surprised by this film and they were surprised that I made it. They said, well, you're not Latino, you know, you're um, hetero, I forget the term, but like you're... Heterosexual? Yes, well, it's more, there's another one, but just cisgendered, hetero, regular person. And I'm like, well, everybody's regular, you know. Right. Exactly. <laughs> That's What exactly does regular mean? That's what I'm trying to say. And there is a universality of spirit and love and no matter what body you're in or what gender you're representing. And um, I was really proud to share that film. Yeah. And um, we played all different festivals, which made it very unique. We did play um, LGBT festivals that was really well accepted. We played Latino festivals. We played in Spain, Barcelona, Mexico. But we also played, you know, in Los Angeles and all over the United States. So there was something in it for everyone. And we even played at black film festivals, too, because people could relate to that, that feeling. And what year was that film? It came out in 2013. 2013. Yeah. And it ran for about a year and a half. It's still running, actually. I still get requests for it. Okay. okay. Where can people go to you see can it? Actually, just Google You're Dead to Me short, and it'll pop up. On, okay. online you can see it's 12 minutes okay. yeah okay. all right so what advice would you give to filmmakers um, and, and this is going to be a, a two-part mm -hmm. question um, those who are looking to do a biopic or a, a film about a person that actually lived um, and then just in doing narrative or documentary films in general what advice would you give to those filmmakers well I'll start with the second question because that's easier <laughs> in general to make a film my advice for filmmakers is to follow two two things I always say follow the dream that you have or whatever it speaks to your heart that's always going to be the most important thing because you can spend time, you cannot sleep, You're working on sleep deprivation, you can work with people that you like and don't like, you can have money and lose money, you can have expectations that aren't met and are met, but as if you don't hold on to that vision, whatever it is, then you will falter. But if you have something that speaks to your heart and you have absolutely no question that it's meaningful to you, then that is your, that is your work, that is the work that you're set out to do. And it's really important to hold on to that because people will tell you no all the time. It's so much easier for people to say no. It's very hard for people to say yes because then there are repercussions and commitments and money and things. So if you can use no as an inspiration to keep going, it's actually, it's like a reverse psychology. I've gotten so many no's. <laughs> and so you should see my rejection file. It's huge. <laughs> But I'm so proud of that because the more no's you get, the more ability you have to reassess and, and believe in yourself and take another approach perhaps. The other thing I say is to know your strengths and staff your weaknesses. So if you know what you're good at, you have to really be honest about that. If you're a producer, what kind of producer are you? Uh, um, a creative producer or a financial producer? You know, what are your strengths? If you're a director but you're not a producer, then focus on directing. If you're a writer but you're not a great producer, focus on the writing. And then whatever you can't do, you staff. You make sure you, you know, and surround yourself with the best people who can do the best work to support your vision. And don't be afraid of that, you know. And it, sometimes it takes a long time to build the perfect team and to find people that you can trust. But you have to understand your limitations so that you can put all your energies toward the best things you can do and not split your time. And so that's why I say know your strengths and staff your weaknesses. <laughs> and, and staff them well. <laughs> staff them well, though, yeah. <laughs> and then for the, the first question, one, one more time, was... Uh, same advice, but for someone who's looking to produce a biopic. A, bio, a biopic in documentary form? Yes. Oh, yes. So best advice for documentary is to research, 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 research. Uh, because factual accuracy is really important in documentary filmmaking, but so is sanity and so is sustainability. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna be on a panel next month about 
mental health for documentarians, and that's something people don't talk about because it's very hard to do what we do. It's not sustainable financially, usually. There's money for the project, but you're usually scraping together and you're usually going without, yeah. without sleep, without money, and without food. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not good. So there is, has to be an element of self-care, and especially for us filmmakers of color who don't have that automatic opportunity, we have to take care of ourselves and we have to lift each other up. You know, I support everybody who needs my help. I will answer a friend's need before I'll answer, you know, a donor's need because we can't do this alone. You know, it takes a village, as they say, to make a film. And you have to believe in people where they are, not think about where they're going and when they're going to be famous, but help them as they are getting there. You know, everybody loves a moving train, but nobody... It's when the train is going up the hill when you really need the help. <laughs> That's right. You need that, that extra boost. Yeah, everyone wants to get on that train when it's taken off and, you know, tearing down the, you know. But that's not when you need the help. You really need the help when, when you're struggling. And the struggle is real. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. On, on many fronts. Now, how has the um, film festival um, experience helped in uh, really getting the word out about this film? It's been amazing. We played it over 45 festivals now. We've won 14 awards, which is amazing. We won the biggest award, which is like the Oscars for docs, is the International Documentary Association Award, okay. the IDAs, as they call it. Yeah. We won Best Music Doc, and uh, that was incredible. Um, to have that j validation from them was fantastic. So when you're in a fe festival, you have many different options. Some festivals are markets where you can try to sell the film to distributors. Some are for the community. And some are for, like, press opportunities where you can, you know, pick so it didn't happen is the phrase. If, if you can't create an event, then you can't prove that it's happened and that it's valuable. So anytime you have a chance to talk about your film, like right now... <laughs> That happens around festivals, so it's really important to try. But they're very competitive, and they're hard to get into. So, you know, being able to be invited someplace is really a wonderful opportunity. Yeah, if you can. And what's next? What projects do you have on the horizon? Oh, I've got some great things happening. I'm uh, directing a piece called Contact High, a visual history of hip-hop. And uh, <laughs> this is really great. I'm so excited about it. The idea is that hip hop has these extraordinary images that have been, you know, seared into our collective consciousness. You know, Biggie with the crown, King of New York, um, uh, Tupac on the cover of Rolling Stone without his shirt, you know, Thug Life. There are so many images that have helped to document the, the whole history of hip hop. But we've never really talked to the photographers who took those photos and seen their contact sheets of all the work and all the things that were happening. So it's a, pardon the pun, but we're looking through the lens of the contact sheets and talking to the photographers for this piece. It opens um, on April 25th in Los Angeles okay. as part of the Annenberg Space for Photography. And they're doing a big exhibit of all of these greatest photographs of hip hop um, that were also documented in a book called Contact High, which came out last year. So really excited about that. And so the film will play in the exhibit. Well, thank you so much for stopping by the Writers Haven Corner at the Annapolis Film Festival and speaking to us about your film, uh, Mr. Soul. Mr. Soul as well as your other projects and Dreamcatchers. Um, this is our last installment of the um, Annapolis Film Festival, and we hope that you've enjoyed all of our interviews. Stay tuned for more, and until next time, catch fire on purpose. The Writer's Haven Show was created to showcase the passion, process, and projects of writers of literature, television, and film. Stream our shows on iHeartRadio, Spreaker, iTunes, Sonos, SoundCloud, Spotify, Alexa, and YouTube. We drop new episodes every week, so subscribe and never miss a show. Find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Tumblr at Author V. Helena, and visit our website at www.writershavenshow.com. See you in the Haven, and until next time, catch fire on purpose.